Have you ever felt like you just didn't fit in? I remember going on a mission trip to southern China where the people are tiny, and I felt tall for one of the first times in my life, and it was great until we went to the street market. And they had a clothing section there. I couldn't find anything in my size. And I asked through an interpreter, you know, do you have anything that would fit me? And the person said, well, we have a few things in the big and fat section over here. <laughs> and that wasn't so great. Or I remember moving from rural Michigan out to New York City and seeing what they charged for parking in Manhattan and just being like inwardly against paying to park my car that much per hour. I'm going to walk for blocks and blocks. I'm not paying that. And feeling like I was just in a strange new world. And maybe you sometimes feel that way in the world we live in now and not in a good way. A couple weeks ago, I was uh, talking to a young couple that was enrolling their child in Sunday school in a different church in town. And on the registration form, it, it asked what pronoun their child wanted to use. And she was three years old. And they just thought, wait a minute, how is this appropriate? Or maybe you've sat next to people who are having an animated argument and they were using language that you thought, whoa, you're talking that way in public? Or maybe you flip through the screen to try to find something to watch and you just thought, this is all worthless. What is our world coming to? And felt out of place with the culture. Our text says, that's not such a bad thing. Our text is about the joy of not fitting in. Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God calls us to be different. I remember reading uh, what one young woman said. She went off to college, and she felt pressured to live in a way that wasn't like she was raised, that wasn't like what she thought God wanted her to live like. And, and it was difficult to say no because, you know, you don't want to be a killjoy. You don't want to be odd. But eventually she came to the point where she said, you know what, this is me. There is, this is who I am. I'm going to find joy in being different in be, I'm learning the joy of being odd. That's how she put it. Because odd can be good. Jesus warned against just going with the flow of where everyone else is going and how everyone else is living. In fact, he said it's vital that you don't do that. You will end up in a horrible place. He said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many which go in there. So if you live like everyone else lives, you end up far from God and from the path of life and of heaven. And that's why followers of Christ are called to be different. We cannot be ready to follow Christ until we're ready to say, even if everyone else goes or lives or believes or does a certain thing, that doesn't mean it's for me. I follow Christ Jesus. I know his way is best for me. The two words in our text that probably stand out the most in this reading are, are the words living sacrifice. Now that would have been a shocking phrase to the people of Paul's day because the temple in Jerusalem was still operating and there were many sacrifices being made, all of them dead. When people heard the word sacrifice, they thought dead. So when Paul says living sacrifice, Oh, that was a shockingly new thought. How can you be a sacrifice and still be living? Well, the Bible says we die to something in order to really live. We die to ourselves. We die to our natural inclinations. We die to, to, to um, the old person in us so that we can live to God. When God calls you to follow him, he calls you to die in some ways to let some part of you be gone and be no more so that your life can be about who God is making you to be. Do you ever wonder 
why churches have such big altars in the front. I mean, if it were only a place to put a book stand and some offering plates, we could do with something smaller. But that altar is always big enough for something else, too. It's big enough to put yourself on it. In my former church, there is this site that I'll never forget. They had a cross, not quite that big, behind the altar. <clears throat> and on the cross, they had a carving of Jesus, kind of like ascending Jesus like that. And every Monday, Thursday, after the service was done and everybody went home, the altar guild stayed behind. And with some helpers, they would take Jesus off the cross for cleaning. And guess where they would lay him while they did that? They'd put him there on the altar. And if you'd ever seen that, I, I, I can't forget the sight right now. Jesus lying on the altar like his, himself a sacrifice for me, which is truly what he did there for my sake. And this passage is calling us to lay our life upon the altar and say, okay, Lord, I die to myself that I might live for you, that you might make me something new. In the days of the early church, sometimes they had to have their worship services in secret. And in Rome, they would go in the catacombs, which was like a, like a burial city. And sometimes they would actually use uh, real coffins as the altar down there in the catacombs. That one has, happens to be St. Agatha. They would try to find someone, you know, better if they were a follower of Christ that people knew. You know, and they would actually use their marble, if they were a nice one, tomb to be the spot where they would hold worship. It's a reminder that a life was given for you. That's why it's called an altar. Jesus sacrificed himself so that we'd be forgiven, so that we would have life, life eternal. And St. Paul points out something else that's different about this life. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. In view of God's mercy. We always have that in view. When I lived in New York City, they had very few local grocery stores like we have here. Mostly they had like um, shop fronts where you could go. One would be a baker, one would be a butcher, one would be a green grocer, and you would just buy a few things for the day. But if you really wanted to stock up, if you had you know, a full-size refrigerator where you were living, um, there were two places in that area where you could go. One actually had a parking lot which was different, but it had barriers around the door of the store so that you couldn't take the shopping cart to your car because shopping carts disappeared in that part of town. So you could only take it just outside the door, and then you had to ferry all your groceries back and forth, back and forth to your car. The other one had a, a ramp and a parking lot on top of the building, so you could drive up and park up there, and when you were up there, you could see the skyline of Manhattan, at least the, the top of it. And it was really beautiful, especially at night. You could look at that, or you could look down the side of the building at the train station with the graffiti and the litter and the garbage, and it was really depressing. But you could choose which direction you wanted to look. And St. Paul is saying, in your life, where are you looking? Where is your Christian life focused? And he says, in view of God's mercy, you offer your life as a living sacrifice. Like this is always in front of you. This is what guides you. This is what makes your life now so inspiring because God's mercy means that you have something wonderful in your life. It means, first of all, that you have acceptance from God. Most people, if they want to feel accepted, think they need to fit in. You don't, because you've already been accepted by the Lord of all, whose opinion is the most important in this world. And you already have that, so you don't have to fit in with other people in order to feel accepted. You're accepted by the God of all. You belong to him. And the other good news is, well, there's more good news. You've been made new in God. 
Paul writes, Do not conform any more to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing is more than just improving. Renewing here is being made new. It's like Psalm 51 where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. It's like I had a right spirit. I had a good heart. Sin did a number on that, but God makes it new again. I come before him and I say, okay, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. I messed up. And he wipes it clean and makes me new. And this is such good news for everyone whose life is littered with failure, like all of us, or scarred by abuse, or darkened by depression, or ruined by addiction, or feels like they've got some mark upon them that they're carrying from the past, God says, don't you know, I make you new. That's my mercy in your life. I take what was there, it's a sacrifice to me, and now there's something better there. There's something that is made new and perfect from the Lord of all. In Christ, you are never who you used to be. You are always now a new creation. Improvement is good, but that's not the whole story of what God does for you. He makes you new every morning. He forgives you and says, child of God, who are you today? And the good news is also that we are known inside and out. You know, all of us want to be, what, noticed? loved, cared for. We seek that in the people that we love, but none of us are perfect, and so sometimes we feel more forgotten or alone or neglected, all the while longing for something better. But brothers and sisters, if God renews your mind, then he knows your mind better than you do if he makes you new. He knows you thoroughly and yet loves you completely. And there's no better combination than that. And the good news is also that you have the approval of God. You remember when you were a child growing up and the approval of your parents meant the world? It meant like what they thought of you profoundly influenced what you thought of yourself. And some people still carry the scars from that. But in God's mercy, in view of his mercy, we're members of God's family now, we have the ultimate love of the Lord God, our Father in heaven. And being forgiven, we're pure and holy in the sight of the one whose opinion matters the most. This goes to the motive of why. Why we would crawl on that altar and, be a sa- and then crawl off again and be a living sacrifice. Why live for God? You know, God could just say, you have to do it because I'm God. That's not really what he does. He lets us know his mercy, his love, his grace for us, that we are, have a new beginning in him, that we are known, that we are accepted and approved of. And your motivation for life flows from what you know of God and who he is for you. It's a different motivation for most people. God calls you to be a willing sacrifice. And he gets very personal about that. He doesn't just say, Offer your minds as a living sacrifice. Think right thoughts. He, gets, he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everything you do is either going to be serving God or not. But when you do, he says, that is true worship. I've heard worship defined this way. As to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. It's not just here when we sing and we listen and we give and we pray, but also when we leave this building and when we live in a way that says, God, this life is yours. I follow you. I give it back to you. And when that's what you're trying to do, Paul says you gain a special ability. He says, then you're able to test and approve what God's will is. We all want to know God's will for us, right? Some, especially when there's a decision to be made or a, a crossroads and we wonder, well, what is God's will for me? Problem is, in my natural self, I got my will and I'm just kind of thinking, if I could just pull God's will over this way, 
so that his will is what I want. Then I'd be really happy. But Paul's saying, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. If you die to yourself and live for God, that's when you start to see what is his will, his good and pleasing and perfect will. That's when your life is where it needs to be. Paul says that the true worship of God is like a relationship. You trust him. You love him back. You live for him. When I was a kid, when I was young, I had this cat that was kind of my cat. Now, no one gave them to me. We had lots of cats. We had barn cats. We had chicken coop cats. We had cats all over the place. But this one was special. This one was drawn to me. If I would go and pick green beans in the garden, like we would have a row from, I don't know, here to the Dowlings over there, and I, I would go down on my knees, you know, and crawl along and pick these beans. This cat would run up to me and jump on my shoulders and start to purr immediately, put some legs on this side of my head, some legs on this side of my neck, and just hang on my shoulders there and sometimes fall asleep, you know? And it would come up to me whenever I was outside like that. Now, I fed all the other cats. I made sure they had what they needed, of course, but... You better believe this one was special. It was drawn to me. And God's looking for something special like that from us. Uh, Something sincere, something beyond the ordinary in life. A life that's drawn to God because we know his love for us. It makes you different, of course. But different can be very, very good. Amen.